Hey, how's it going? This is Chad Haig reporting from Southern India. I'd like to continue this series of videos walking through the entire open online free textbook foundation course in reading German. In this 10th overall uh, video within the series, we will actually not be moving on to the 9th unit as you might expect for, as you might recall, every 4th unit within this textbook. Um, the book asks you to pause for a moment and do a little bit of practice and review to test your knowledge of really the grammatical principles you just learned over the past four units, but of course you're also testing yourself over everything learned thus far. So um, since we finished the eighth unit recently, we're now moving on to that test. The format is one in which you um, see 20 different German sentences, and you not only uh, translate it back into English, but you also try to identify which grammatical principle is being instantiated or exemplified within that particular sentence. So the way that we'll do this over YouTube is I will read the German sentence out loud and of course show the sentence, the text of it on the screen. You should then pause the video and we will meet back after you uh, both translated and I would recommend at, under your English translation just write out which grammatical principle you think um, can be identified as exemplified within that sentence. So the first sentence is Wo in Deutschland regnet es am meisten? Nicht in Hamburg, sondern in München. So go ahead and pause the tape. We'll meet back in a moment. So the suggested translation is where in Germany does it rain the most? Not in Hamburg, but rather in Munich. So the am meisten construction here is of course an example of the superlative. So um, within English also, we have the ability to simply affirm that a given entity has a given property. But if we then um, consider it in relation to another similar entity with say the same property and actually compare the quality of the one to the quality of the other, we can use language to um, claim that one of them has that quality more or let's just say in a higher degree than the other. For example, um, you know, the uh, band Jethro Tull has um, good music. We can say that if we just examine them intrinsically, but if we compare them to another band, like say even ACDC, we could say, well, they're both really good bands, but um, Jethro Tull has even better music. And then if we compare them to all the rock and roll bands of the 1970s, we could say, well, there's a lot of good music there, but um, Jethro Tull has the best music. So the superlative construction is not just a comparison to one other thing in which you'd use the comparative form. It's rather uh, comparing it to all other things within this hypothetical set, it's the most. So within Germany, which place within the country gets the most rain, according, according to this, it is um, not Hamburg, but rather Munich. So we will move on now to the second sentence. In German, Hunger ist der beste Koch und das Höchste ist aber die Liebe sind Sprichworte. Dieses sagt Klaus gern, aber jenes sagt er am liebsten. So go ahead and pause the tape and we'll meet back in a moment. So its suggested translation is hunger is the best cook, and but the highest thing is love um, are both sayings. Okay, Sprichwörter. What we care about really with regard to these sayings is that Klaus likes to say the latter, but he prefers to say the former. Now, do you remember how we talked about the form and the latter within German? Mm. Here we have um, dieses and jenes, okay? And um, this clarifies, um, you know, which one of these we're talking about, the first one that was mentioned in that list, or the second. This is the way to distinguish it within German. But here we also have the superlative, um, but this is um, one which shows particularly nicely the um, irregularity of this um, uh, shift from the comparative to the superlative form, because um, the first one, you know, is uh, dieses sagt Klaus gern. He likes to say that, um, but uh, the second one um, is uh, with the superlative form am liebsten. So we have gern and am liebsten as kind of um, variations on the same idea, but very different forms. Again, and am liebsten. This is different 
from a regular um, comparative and superlative form, like in English you have, um, he's tall, but um, that other guy's taller than him, but of course the third guy's tallest among the three, you have this irregularity um, in which only the suffix at the end changes. Here we have something a little bit like, you know, um, this is good, that's better, that's best, a little bit like that. So we'll move on now to the third one. Sein singender Vogel stört mich viel, aber dein bellender Hund stört mich am meisten. Ich werde unbedingt mehr als je zuvor schreien, wenn ich diesen Lärm nochmals höre. Right, go ahead and pause the tape. We'll meet back in a moment. His singing bird disturbs me quite a bit, but your barking dog disturbs me most. If I hear this noise one more time, I will definitely scream more than ever before. So once again, we have the superlative form. They seem rather um, fond of that in this particular test. But um, in addition to that, which we've already talked about quite a bit um, in this video, we also have a very interesting um, grammatical construction here in which um, we know that singen is the infinitive uh, form of the verb to sing. Okay, bellen uh, is the infinitive for to bark, but the way that we talk about a bird as singing without having that be the conjugated verb of it. Okay, so we do not have in this sentence something like in English, um, that bird is singing or that dog is barking. They're not verb forms. Rather, what we have here is um, a transformation of the infinitive into um, an adjectival form. We could describe this as the singing bird and the barking dog. Now, do you remember how we do that? Oh, we take the um, present participle, okay? Um, in uh, English, it's the ing that you add after sing, it becomes singing. In German, you add that, um, that d after the infinitive, and then we um, also have this um, uh, declension, right? We have this adjustment of the form to reflect things like gender, number, case, etc. So that gives us sein singender Vogel and dein bellender Hund. So the fourth sentence is immer mehr Leute werden krank. Es wird wohl eine neue Grippe sein, die jetzt herumgeht. Go ahead and pause that, think about it, and we'll meet back in a moment. More and more people are getting sick. There's probably a new strain of flu going around now. Now think very carefully about the um, verb werden that you see in this these um, sentences. You might recall that the eighth unit um, was dedicated to werden because um, the question, what does werden mean in English? Well, a, a lot of things, quite frankly, um, depending on context. Here we have the standard werden in isolation, I guess you could say, which simply means to become. Uh, immer mehr Leute werden krank, more and more people are becoming sick. Uh, but then we have um, werden um, allowing us not to talk about the future, as it might look like, okay? Es wird wohl eine neue Grippe sein, die jetzt herumgeht. It might maybe look to the naked eye at first like this is will, okay? Um, there will be a new um, strain of flu going around. No, no, no. This is a hypothesis um, without full certainty being made about the events observed at the present moment. And this is what we, in English would be a probability statement. We say there probably is such and such. Well, in German, we um, form that by using werden in conjunction with another word. Do you remember what that other word is? Oh yes, it is wohl, which um, in some context means well. Okay, so we'll move on now to the fifth question. Das Gelernte ist natürlich nicht immer richtig und das Geschriebene nicht immer wahr. Go ahead and pause the tape. We'll meet back in a moment. So the suggested translation is um, that which is learned is of course not always right and that which is written is not always true. Now the translation into English adds some extra words, that which is learned, um, but we don't really have that many words in um, German to communicate the same idea. Um, really just das gelernte um, and das geschriebene. Now, which principle grammatically did we learn to explain how you can do that in German? Well, there are rules um, for transforming 
um, one um, part of speech into another, but keeping the same sort of basic idea. Um, you want to talk about um, learning as an infinitive verb, uh, form, uh, verb. you have learning, you have um, schreiben as um, the infinitive of writing, but you want to talk, um, we learned last question about um, having a verb be an adjective of another noun, we can do that in the way we saw last time, but here we have something different. Here we have um, trying to talk about that as a noun in itself. Um, the learned, what you learn in school, for example, is not always right. And the written, something is written in a book, that very fact in itself does not guarantee that it's true. So here we're talking about the learned and the written, and we get these nouns from the verb by basically taking the, if you notice the ku at the beginning, that is the past participle rather than the present participle as we saw last time. Okay, we will now move on to the sixth question. Uh, question number six is Die Abhandlung behandelt die Handhabung radioaktiven um, Materials und seiner Lagerung. Sie stellt nach wie vor ein großes Problem dar. So go ahead and pause the tape. We'll meet back in a moment. Suggested translation is the treatment um, treats the handling of radioactive material and its storage. Now is then it presents a big problem. So we have um, here basically um, uh, a few different uh, variations on a similar idea. Even in the English translation, we talk about the treatment treats something. So uh, we have the sense that the abhandlung and behandelt have some sort of relation in which one of them seems to be a verb and the other seems to be a noun derived from the verb through certain predictable rules. So we have that uh, going on here. We also have han habung um, as, as something it looks like the same sort of variation, another variation on ultimately they all go back to the same thing. We also have here um, an interesting word, um, stellt. Um, and th uh, the um, ending of it, da, as something with many words in between. Sie stellt nach wie vor ein großes Problem dar. So why do we have, um, if the infinitive form is darstellen, which is a type of presentation um, in German, uh, why do we have da all the way on the other side of stellt? Well, this is a separable prefix, as we learned about earlier. So we move on now to the seventh question. Mit der Auflösung des Subjekts in der Moderne löst sich auch die Auffassung vom Autor als original Genie auf. Parallel verlief die Lösung von der Philosophie des Idealismus. So, go ahead and um, pause the tape. We'll meet back with comparison of translations in just a moment. All right, so one thing which we um, can say immediately is that the suggested translation with the dissolution of the subject in the modern age came also the dissolution of the conception of the author as an original genius. This is, of course, the, um, a critique of Kant. There's a very philosophical um, sentence here, well, one of many very philosophical things that we'll be reading within the German language if we um, hope to uh, gain the ability to do so. So um, the next one is parallel to this occurs the disengagement from the philosophy of idealism. Which idealism? Probably German idealism. Oh, see, we're already getting to, uh, you know, use German to study philosophy, aren't we? So once again, what we can see here is that um, we have Auf at the very end of that first sentence, and that is, uh, of course, a separable prefix. What are we talking about? Well, we're talking about um, th that which löst sich, right? Um, we also have here a very interesting um, variation on a uh, lösen. We have Auflösen, okay, and then we have Löslösen. Okay, and the idea of this is that we have a dissolution apparently being spoken of um, in the first as Auflösung, and then uh, we also have a disengagement as Loslösung in the second. So then we move on to the eighth question. Zwischen uh, 1988 uh, und 1998 
hat die EU ihre Exporte in die mittel- und osteuropäischen Beitrittsländer um das sechs kann man ähm, fünffache die Importe um das vier kann man fünffache gesteigert. Um, this tells us as a little vocabulary that das Beitrittsland is a country joining or applying to join the EU. So we'll compare uh, translations in just a moment. So the suggested translation is between 1988 and 1998, the EU increased its exports into the potential EU member countries in Eastern and Central Europe by 6.5 times and its um, imports by 4.5 times. So we have here, of course, a very important example of the things we have learning about uh, thus far, including the idea that as far as word order is concerned, we have that um, conjugated verb hot occupying the second general position, maybe not literally the second word, but we have this um, thing about time uh, between such and such years at the very beginning. That's why we have the uh, subject also following after the conjugated verb, um, the EU is the subject, right? Um, and then we have the conjugated, I mean, excuse me, we have the participle at the very end of the whole thing, gesteigert. Okay, so then we move on to the ninth sentence. Um, weil die Umweltbeamten in Frankreich auf die Einhaltung der Vogelschutzrichtlinie dringen, protestieren die französischen Jäger. Hmm, Jäger. Well, we know what Jäger is <laughs> informally in America uh, as a very strong drink, which, you know, quite frankly, the only time I've drunk Jäger is a time I do not remember. I was only told in the morning that I had. So we all know what Jäger is um, in America, but what German word does that really come from? We'll read the sentence. We'll come back in a moment and compare. Okay, so because the environmental officials in France insist on enforcing the directive for the protection of birds, French hunters are protesting. So here we have protestieren die französischen Jäger. But wait a minute, why is the um, French hunters as the subject who are protesting, why do they come at the end of this sentence? I thought um, at the very least that um, the... Um, the uh, subject comes before the verb, if you think about the way that um, sentences are formed in English. Well, here we have two different clauses um, within the sentence. One of them is independent, the other dependent. The dependent clause is the one introduced by one of those, oh yes, subordinating conjunctions. Similarly, in the form in English would be because such and such, it's incomplete. We have to have the other one because of um, the enforcement of the directive for the protection of birds, then we find the independent clause, the French hunters are protesting. Now that could be a sentence all on its own because it does not have because, but since we especially start the sentence with the dependent clause, we have vile at the beginning of that clause, the whole sentence, but that clause in particular, that is why we have um, dringen, um, a conjugated verb at the end of that clause, followed by um, another conjugated verb, protestieren, okay. Um, followed by the subject of the second clause's verb. Now, this is one of those obscure rules we did cover recently within the class. You kind of recognize dringen and protestieren kind of right next to each other, separated by a comma. So, recognize that form if you see it again. Now, we move on to the next sentence. Die größten Maßhalter unter den Spulmaschinen <coughs> cool und ge Frie Schrank, Schränken verbrauchen heute fast 40% weniger Strom als ihre Vorfahren vor etwa 10 Jahren. Now we have a little vocabulary. Mas halten means to act, behave, or function in moderation. So we will meet back in a moment and compare translations. So if you take a look at the English translation here, among dishwashing machines, refrigerators, and freezers, um, we find here already something of a comparison among the three. That's why, by the way, um, there is the word among rather than between. You only use the word between if you are comparing two items or whatever. Um, if it's more than two, it's among. So we already have something of a um, talk of something like the superlative here. Um, the most energy efficient, okay, 
within that set. Um, but here we have another comparison. They utilize almost 40% less electricity today than their predecessors of 10 years ago had. So even among the same models or whatever, um, the same products, um, we've seen an increase in efficiency. So how can we talk about a comparison of the same model to itself, basically, how much had it improved? Well, the way that we see this here is um, we're talking about 40% less energy um, as the measure for that improvement. Here we have um, in German um, the idea of um, uh, 40% weniger Strom als ihre Vorfahren vor etwa 10 Jahren. So we have that um, weniger is less and als is that sort of word like then that allows us to do this. So we move on now to the 11th question. Bei der Herstellung dieses Computers hat man keine Kosten gescheut und den neuesten Stand der Forschung zur Anwendung gebracht. Okay, so let's pause the tape for a moment and compare translations when we come back in just a moment. Suggested translation is in the production or manufacture of this computer. They spared no cost and they took advantage of the latest research. So with all this talk of the superlatives, um, you might be looking for a certain construction of superlative in this that is uh, missing. It's not the um, meisten, whatever uh, construction we've already seen. Rather, here we have um, a superlative in the adjective itself modifying the noun. Here we have in the English translation, the latest research. So in German, we have the idea of um, den neuesten Stand der Forschung zu Anwendung gebracht. What they had done is they had taken advantage of that latest research. So if we move on now to the uh, 12th sentence, nachdem der Wechselkurs des Dollar weiter gesunken war, haben sich die Exporte erhöht. Um, das bestehende Handeldefizit ist zwar kleiner geworden, man hat es aber noch nicht ganz bestätigt. So we have a little vocabulary here. Das Handelsdefizit is the trade deficit. Mm, something the United States doesn't really seem to care. Is at a, uh, a at something of a record level right now. Um, they are um, importing more stuff apparently from China, according to Sticks, because um, the number of people who can afford better made products than that cheap junk has dropped. That means the prosperity in America has dropped. So this is the sort of thing you should care about. But how do we talk about it in German? We'll get back to that in a moment. So if you look at the um, translation, the um, um, number of um, different clauses that we have to deal with to talk about such a complicated matter as this is enough that um, even in the first sentence we have two different um, nested clauses there, one of which therefore has to be introduced um, by a subordinating conjunction, that is nach dem or after. So because of the suspension of ordinary word rules when you have such a subordinate conjunction like because or after, um, we find the conjugated verb voch at the end of that before the comma, but we also find it followed after that comma by another conjugated verb haben. That's why you find this may be peculiar the first time you see a construction of var, comma, haben. That is the reason why var, by the way, following after gesunken, which is the past participle. We also find um, a pair of um, clauses within the second sentence, but um, you don't see the same suspension of word order so much there because the conjunction is not a subordinating conjunction like after or because. Um, it is rather a coordinating conjunction. A coordinating conjunction in English to uh, joins two independent clauses, which could technically be a, a full sentence on their own. We just join them because they're closely related to each other. We want to contain them in the same sentence. So that is why in the second um, one you see um, uh, but or aber, and that is why you, de you do not see the conjugated verb hot at the very end of that second sentence. So we move on now to the 13th. Question. Das Problem ihrer Beseitigung 
außer Acht lassen, hat die Produktion von Giftgas kommenden Generationen viele Probleme bereitet. A little vocabulary is um, außer Acht lassen is to leave out of consideration. So we'll pause for a moment, translate and return in a moment to compare. So the first time you look at, um, especially the English translation, um, leaving aside the problem of its disposal, comma, the production of poison gas has left coming generations many problems. You might uh, be tempted to think that this is uh, very similar to the last question in which we saw um, a comma separating um, the different clauses, one of which is independent, the other of which is dependent, and therefore one of which would have that subordinating um, conjunction like because, after, etc. But here we have something a little bit uh, different than that going on. For in order to be a um, even dependent clause, you would have to have some sort of a conjugated verb in the first um, half of it before the comma. But um, if, if you look even um, in English, um, you might be tempted to think that leaving okay, is that conjugated verb. But even in English, it's actually not a conjugated verb, nor is it even a verb at all. And this is even more obvious in German, because whereas in English, you do have constructions in the present progressive tense, like um, I am leaving, it still uses the ing form. Um, in German, the present participle form, which we do see here, by the way, it's um, the um, infinitive lassen, as the vocabulary tells us, followed by that D, that tells us explicitly this is a present participle. The present participle in German is quite simply never used as an actual verb. It is always used as an adjectival function describing some of the thing. And what it's describing here is um, the problem. What, has, what exactly has been left out of consideration? Well, um, the problem, specifically the problem in the genitive, um, you know, followed by the genitive, the problem of its disposal, but it's basically the problem that has been left out of consideration. And um, the um, relation between that and leaving is not once again between a subject and a verb. It is rather between a subject and an adjective, okay? So that is why we only have the, really the conjugated verb here of hat, okay? Which is in that second position. Keep in mind that whole adjectival phrase, leaving aside the problem of its disposal with the present participle, that whole thing is basically occupying position one in the formula for German word order, followed by the conjugated verb hat, and the par past participle bereitet, okay, um, at the very end of the whole sentence. We move on now um, to the 14th question. In der Bundesrepublik im Vergleich mit anderen, um, e.g. Ländern, stehen die Betriebe bei weitem am kurzesten während der Ferien still. So um, we'll go ahead and pause the tape and compare translations when we come back in a moment. So in a classic fashion of this particular test, we once again are talking about the superlative form. This time we're talking about um, which companies halt production the least, and not just the least, but by far the least, um, during the um, holiday season. And the way that we talk about that in this particular case is we have um, that kurzesten, uh, and we have um before it, um kurzesten, okay? Um, as the way to signal that out of all of them, the superlative, um, in a kind of a perverse, reverse version of the superlative, superlative is usually the most, this is actually the inverse of that, the least, well, that's how we talk about it. Now move on to the 15th question. Kommunikation, auch politische, ist an Sprache und sprachliche um, vermittelte Welte fachen. Und Weltdeutung gebunden. Mm, that sounds very Heideggerian. So here we're talking about the Weltdeutung, which the um, uh, book tells us here is the interpretation of the world. Mm, this once again sounds very Heideggerian. Once again, Kommunikation, uh, auch politische, ist an Sprache und sprachlich vermittelte Welte fahren und Weltdeutung gebunden. It's also very Hegelian. So compare, um, we'll have the translations compared between you and I in just a moment. So, if we take a look at the suggested translation, 
we see that um, this is talking about um, the problem of communication, including political communication, being bound with language and linguistically mediated experience and interpretation of the world. So don't you love already getting deep into philosophy in the original language of German? Mm, that's so much a fun that, of course, we'll devote a whole series on this channel to being able to do that. But what exactly, grammatically speaking, is going on here that is worthy of our attention in light of the units we recently covered within this book? Well, take a look very, very carefully at the um, verb in this sentence. Now, your first um, expectation might be to think, well, of course we have um, ist following in basically the second position um, because it is an auxiliary which is um, sort of introducing this broader construction with all these words in between it and its past participle form in much the same way that you would have hot blah 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 gesagt at the very end of the sentence. So here we have ist in position two and gebunden, which um, past participle basically we have g and we have um, the en at the end to um, signal that it is an irregular by the way as in even in um, English bind and bound are irregular. Okay, so that looks like it checks out. We have communication, you know, subtract some extra words, um, is um, bound up with all these extra words. Okay, but for the moment, all we care about is those three. Communication and is or has bound itself up with um, language and linguistically mediated experience. But is that really what is going on here? Now, if you look up um, binden in a dictionary, you will see that the kind of verb it is listed as within the dictionary can give you a clue about whether this construction makes sense. Now, I'll grant that um, you can use ist with a past participle for certain class of verbs, which is uh, the intransitive verbs. If you do not have a an object of the verb, to which or to whom the action of the verb is being transitively transferred. Then, um, so if you don't, then you would use um, sein as your auxiliary rather than haben. But is binden such an intransitive verb? And are we even claiming in this particular sentence that um, the action here is not really being transferred to anyone? Well, we have this idea that um, the communication is being bound up um, in relation to these other things. So it's immediately kind of suspicious, but if you look up the dictionary form of Binden, you will see that it's listed as VT. It is a transitive verb. Therefore, ist cannot be the um, past participle if indeed this is the action being performed indicatively by the subject of the sentence. For that, we would have to have hot. So which rule did we learn recently in this series um, that this exemplifies? Well, you might remember that um, if a a verb like ist is being used where um, the participle following after is a transitive verb, we know that it is not being used as a past tense verb. It is rather the past participle is being used as an adjective. The example, the window is closed, um, you know, is uh, the one we considered as, well, even if you were talking about closing something, um, you would have to use haben rather than sein. This is another example. Here, gebunden is an adjective describing the communication as being bound. Well, bound with what? With these other things. Okay, we now we move on to the 16th sentence. Nach dem Mann die Grenze zwischen der DDR und der BRD geöffnet hatte, ist die weitere Entwicklung der Ereignisse den Händen der überraschten Politiker entglitten. Um, the textbook tells us, as a matter of vocabulary, that entglitten is to slip away from or to escape control. So we'll compare translations in just a moment. Okay, so one suggested translation is um, after they had opened the border between the GDR and the FRG, further development of events um, eluded the surprised politicians' grasp. <laughs> And you probably notice right from the very start of the sentence in German that we have one of those subordinating conjunctions after nachdem. That is why you see, um, regardless of all the other words, you see immediately that um, the um, end of that first clause before the comma is hatte, which is a conjugated verb, and the um, first word following after that comma is ist, which is also a 
conjugated derivative. So this is once again a great example of that sort of construction which is maybe easy to forget as a native English speaker because we don't have equivalent rules like that but this is still something very important to keep in mind in German. So we now move on to the 17th sentence. Studenten, die schon eine andere Fremdsprache gelöst haben, werden sich schon mit diesem Thema beschäftigt haben. So this is a sentence we will compare translations for in just a moment. Okay, so where exactly we might ask to begin with is the conjugated verb of maybe the, the main one within the whole sentence. Well, we find that um, after the uh, second comma, right? We find um, students, uh, studenten, and then werden, okay? And then we have haben at the end of this whole sentence. Um, so this is giving us something like we know just from this much information, talking about the future will have, and then of course what they will have done is um, dealt with this topic. But which students are we talking about? Well, we're talking about the students who have already learned another foreign language. This is not all students in the class whatsoever without any further qualification. No, we're trying to introduce a little more information to single out which students we're talking about. And this is an example of, in English grammar, this would be like in a positive. For example, um, Martin Heidegger, or I'll just use Hegel instead, um, Hegel, the uh, most fascinating German philosopher of the whole 19th century, um, lived in the 18th and 19th centuries. Okay, maybe not the best example, but still we have this idea that um, Hegel, well, who's that? The, the most interesting philosopher of the 19th century. Okay, so we have this a positive as a certain short description. Okay, and um, the way that um, in this particular case that a positive is introduced is with D. Now, why are we using D? I thought that was the word for the. Well, it is the word for the in the plural. That's why we're using D instead of der or das or, um, you know, one of the uh, singular masculine or neuter forms. We're showing that this is plural, okay, regardless of gender, with D. But in this case, a D does not mean the. It means who and we use this in order to uh, introduce this this other stuff here about die schon eine andere Fremdsprache gelernt haben. Okay, so great rule difference between um, the D as um, article or as a who word. Now move on to the 18th sentence. Bislang hatten die Statisch, um, Statistischen Landesämter verkehrt Fälle noch nach dem Alter der Fortsegefühle oder nach den Lichtverhältnissen ähm, ausgewertet, die zum Zeitpunkt des Unfalls herrschten. So the vocabulary tells us that um, der Herz, uh, excuse me, der Fortsegefühle uh, is the driver of a vehicle. Now we move on to the translation. We'll compare in just a moment. So the suggested translation, up to now, the state statistical offices had evaluated traffic accidents only in terms of the age of the driver or the light conditions prevailing at the time of the accident. On a grammatical level, what we see here is, once again, that word D, following after the last comma that we see within the whole sentence, um, or Actually, maybe that's the first comma, but at any rate, um, it's after the comma near the very end of the sentence. Um, we see D. Once again, is that um, the word the in the plural, or is that rather, in English, we would say the word which? And what is it introducing? Die zum Zeitpunkt des Unfalls herrschten. Um, the such and such, which at the point of time of the accident had been such and such. So here we're talking specifically about the light conditions and the age of the driver, which were prevailing at the time of the accident. So once again, D as article or D as which slash who slash that. 19th sentence, the Arbeitsgemeinschaft für Frauen in Forschung und Lehre unterstützt. The uh, Commission for Gleichbehandlung der Hen for Sitzende einer Frau aus der AG ist und den Arbeits 
Kreis vor Gleichbehandlungsfragen, deren Vorsitzende ebenfalls ein Mitglied der AG ist. A little vocabulary. Die Kommission ist the Commission. Die Gleichbehandlung ist the Equal Treatment. Um, das Arbeitskreis um, is the Working Council, Working Circle or Working Group. So, we now compare translations when you come back in just a moment. Alright, so if we take a look at the suggested translation that the Working Group for Women in Research and Teaching supports the Commission for Equal Treatment, whose chair is a woman from the Working Group, as well as the Working Council on Equal Treatment Issues, which is also chaired by a member of the Working Group. We have, once again, this idea of um, the words which in English we use, like which, to uh, introduce that appositive, um, words that look usually like the article the, but in this case, we actually don't find that. Instead, we see these words deren and deren, which we've never seen before. But we have the sense that it's maybe a different case of the same word, roughly speaking, that we've already been looking at. Now, if we look back at our um, grammatical paradigms we covered recently, we'll see that deren is a great example of um, this sort of idea of the word which, that, who, etc. in German, that in the genitive case specifically, it does not simply reduplicate the morphological form of the genitive article. You might keep in mind that the genitive article for um, the uh, masculine would be des for the feminine, it would be der for the plural, it would be der. Well, here we have deren rather than der um, to show the genitive construction here. Even in English, we render that in, in the genitive form of whose chair. We're talking in a certain sense about a relation between um, the, the chair and the possession as being broken up in English between um, chair and hus, and um, in German we have a similar idea with using um, that uh, which word in the genitive case deren. All right, so we finally reach the 20th question of this test. Die Forscher veränderten zunächst das vieren Erbmaterial dieses schleusten sie in affinierten Zellen ein mit deren Hilfe die kompletten neuen Viren entstanden. So, go ahead and do your translation. We'll come back in just a moment and compare. Okay, the suggested translation is the researchers first changed the virus gene material, which they then introduced into monkey kidney cells, which in turn allowed the complete new viruses to reproduce. So, once again, we have that word deren, but this time, um, we have it uh, not following immediately after the comma, introducing a positive, but rather following after with. And the reason it, for this is that we're talking about um, uh, what was done with the help, but with the help of what? Well, with the help of them, basically, with, with their help, right, uh, from these... Um, Relation between a uh, virus uh, introduced into monkey kidney cells, we're talking about uh, plurality, and what we're talking about here is the help of them in the genitive mit deren Hilfe. Okay, so this will com conclude the test today. Thank you so much. We move forward to the ninth unit next video.